Welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Lens. This is Jake along with Scott. And today we're excited to venture over to the other Commonwealth, Virginia, to meet with Catoctin Creek. And today we have Becky Harris, chief of everything. She's on top of her her husband as, as the general manager, She's making sure everything runs well, because we all know that women run the world. So Becky, thanks for making time for us today as this podcast will release in May, but during during Women's Month. So thanks for, for joining us here on the Bourbon Lens. Thank you. Excited to be here. Well, we're, we're excited to have you. And I was the most nervous about saying this brand's name from a US-based uh, brand because uh, I, I thought I was going to get tripped up. Uh, I really did. But all is good. I think I think you nailed it. I did. I, I listened to the on their website. They they show you how to phonetically say it. So uh, that always that always helps. It does. Yes, it's the first thing we teach people when we go <laughs> yeah. to our market is how do you say it? You say Catoctin. Yeah. No. That, that I always I always get on Jake because uh, <laughs> nine times out of ten he does good, but that that tenth time he really messes it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No offense. It's a it's a regional name and it's absolutely something that, you know, we talk about all the time is one of the first things that we say is this is how you got to say it. So, why don't we start there? You know, for me not knowing a ton about the brand, let's start a little like right there at the beginning. The name. What what does that mean and how does that get you all started as as a brand, uh, you know, 14 years into the game here? So it's um, it's a regional name. Um, if you uh, look um, in the the in Camp David, um, where Camp David is in Maryland, those are the Catoctin Mountains. Um, there's a Catoctin Creek that flows toward the Potomac from Maryland. There's a Catoctin Creek that flows toward the Potomac from Virginia, and it's less than a half a mile from the distillery. So it was. It's it's all over the area where we're from, and so we felt like it really kind of reflected the place. And, you know, I think making whiskey with a sense of place was something we always wanted to do. Even 14 years ago, we were talking about the place. And um, so so that was kind of why we chose it. Um, mm. We didn't realize it was such a hard name to say um, until we started going a little further afield. But, you know, hey, if people can learn to say like Bonahaven and Bonahaven and uh, and uh, Lafroig and things like that, they can learn to say Catoctin. Yeah, it's definitely got more of a state feel than than those you know world whiskeys. And so you know, just staying with the theme of of just who you all are at the essence, I think it's more and more common to see someone with your background in chemical engineering really kind of to get into to whiskey and whiskey production. And that wasn't always the case, right? With the the Russells and, and the old school families, right? It was like, hey, my daddy and daddy's taught me how to how to make make whiskey. So as you're coming out of, of college and you're got this chemical engineering degree, did you think you would end up in the spirits industry? Or is that kind of how did that progress into to where you are today? Uh, no, when I, I start, so I've done um, chemical engineering is, is, you know, a lot of it was kind of brought up into oil and gas industries, um, you know, uh, plastics and things like that. When I got out of school, I um, worked for a company named Amico Foam Products. They made the clamshell containers. Then I got a job working for Seba Vision, making contact lenses. That's actually extremely hard. <laughs> um, and so some, my husband was working for a company doing, um, he, he's, he was a computer engineer. And so he was doing government contracting, working for, um, on classified programs for the Navy. And he said, and he got the idea to do this. He likes to say that, you know, 25 years of government contracting taught him a great love of drinking <laughs> and, that, you know, some years into a bunch of PowerPoints, he was inspired to, you know, do something else. And um, so he came to me with the idea. And um, it, frankly, distillation is a pretty straightforward process. So I, I wasn't really intimidated by learning what to do. It was more, can we make money doing mm. this? And honestly, that's the hardest thing about this business is making money in this business. Um, and so, you know, we um, we we kind of gave it, went and I said, I, I can learn to do it. So my qualifications were much more suited to the production side and he was much more ready to do the business side. So that's kind of how we split it up, which was unusual at the time. 
Um, I probably only knew maybe a half dozen women that ran stills, you know, in mm. craft spirits, especially um, at the time that we started the company. And, you know, well, now everybody's got a woman, <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we all line them up and that's great. There should be more women. There should be women in every, you know, who are, who are technically, who can be in the technical side. So it's, it's, it's really great to see how far we've come and, you know, kind of to, see what we can do to make it go even farther. Mm. No, I I think that's, that's so right. Um, but like, you know, take us back to probably mid 2009, you're stills up and running. What was it like to run and and cut your first, you know, distillation process? Can you like, I don't feel like we talked to a lot of distillers, distillers about, you know, that memory in particular of, Hey, what was this first cut? Like, what did it taste like? Do you remember like those kind of like, those aha moments of like, Hey, we, we kind of have something good before we put it into the barrel. It was always for me about having something that was really appealing to me Mm -hmm. going into the barrel, because especially when we started in 2009, you know, our, the product we sold when we had started, we wanted to, to sell the white spirit. We wanted to sell the gin, but we're in a control state. And when you list your things, they choose what they want to take and they wanted the whiskey. Mm. So the first whiskeys I sold were only a few months old. Um, so they had to be really delicious going into the barrel because they, they were really only kissed at that point, um, you know, to come out, but, but it always tasted good. So my cuts were extremely tight and, um, you know, it wasn't till some years later as we kept, you know, always being a little bit ahead with production that we were able to get to where we are now, which I feel is really the the best place for the product that we're making. So we use 30 gallon barrels. Mm. So that gives me a little acceleration, but it also gives it seasonality, which I think is really key. And um, so they're just right around two years old right now. And in a 30 gallon barrel, that's just about just right. You know, when you look at the curves of flavor curves, You see that, you know, really where the impact of the grain hits the impact of the wood, that's really right around two years. And Mm. for me, that's just with rye, especially, especially 100% rye. um, There's no corn in there. Corn often has a lot of harsher flavors that just need more time to mellow. Mm -hmm. And so for that was really one of the things that we found so key was, you know, 100% rye and then those 30 gallon barrels and then really allowing, you know, now where we are, we allow the seasonality. And so I don't have to make the cuts quite as narrow as I used to, because now I want a little bit more of that in there because I'm going to have time and, you know, interaction with the wood and the oxygen to really help kind of improve those flavors and really get those textures because Mm -hmm. the textures are really what wins, I think, when you're really enjoying the spirit. Well, I've been sipping the the spirits as we we've talked already, and and for us to or for you to share that it's only two years old, like it does have a depth of flavor to it. Um, you know, from from a, a rye whiskey perspective, you know, a lot of people even that are using fifty threes only come out in twenty four month uh, increments. So, you know, I know just talking with other rye whiskey companies like Dad's Hat and that have used smaller por- like profile barrels that you can get a lot of flavor from a rye, and so it's like you know two years in the barrel may feel like the flavor profile of maybe almost three because of of that smaller format and more surface area touching. So, you know, I just, I'm kind of shocked that at the depth of flavor at the age uh, on on these barrels. I think you look at the, the smaller format is one piece, but I think even the more important piece is actually the, um, that we do everything using, um, you know, a batch process. So it's a, you know, a hybrid pot still. Mm -hmm. And so you're making these cuts and, you know, if you want to kind of talk about some things that a lot of people have been talking about in the real world is, you know, whether it be Leopold's three chamber still, and they talk about what that does for rye and how, when you're distilling at, when your mash is at its lowest proof, you're bringing off other things, more texture, right? If you're using a Kentucky style beer still, you're flashing off pretty darn fast. And you're not really getting to the point where you're just cooking this stuff and bringing these very fatty, heavy um, textures off. And that's really what you do both in 
the three chamber still is just essentially an automated version of a pot still, right? They're just trying to make it a continuous process akin to the Kentucky style beer still, but they're optimizing it for rye, which is a very different grain. Mm. So what we're doing is we don't have a three chamber still. I have a pot still and I can make those decisions based on the flavor and the texture coming off. And we go really far into it. Our cycle for, you know, our our 300 gallon pot still is, you know, in our 500 gallon pot still, it's, it's, it's about six hours. So we're, you know, we're really distilling this for a long time. And as you're distilling things for a longer time, new flavor profiles are created and new flavor profiles come off because different things come off. It's an asymptotic relationship and different things are coming off at different proof levels. And that's really where you get these textures and the textures where you get that depth of flavor and it coats your tongue. And you're just like, yeah, this is really where the the winning stuff is. So it's, it's not the easy way to make rye. It's not the cheap way to make rye. This mm-hmm. is the best <laughs> way to make rye. Mm. Yeah. Well said. Jake, I- that reminds me back, uh, few weeks back when we were at the moonshine university oh yeah you know talking about the still and mm. you know the progression of flavor as you as you just sit there and let it do its thing yeah well i think that's what people don't realize like i think we were five years into this we were kind of ignorant to the cutting of of the whiskey and, and watching it you know cook and do its thing i think just now after doing Moonshine You and then now hearing Becky speak, I think it's way more interesting. It's like come to life a little bit from a from a portfolio perspective of just like, hey, understanding this is how it's made and this is how the flavors and the depths of flavors come to life. This is where you're getting those certain elements of the whiskey rather mm-hmm. than just wood influence as well. Yeah. Right. You know, you, you, when you talk to, you know, when we, we had a conversation with Larry Eversold at one time and he, you know, said to me, you know, you know what you should do, you should get a continuous column still. And I, you know, he's like, you can do in three minutes what it takes you six hours to do. Mm. And, you know, yeah, you can't beat that from an economic standpoint, right? But am I ever going to beat MGP or any of the bigs from an economic standpoint? Yeah. Hell no. <laughs> There's no way I can do that. They source on global scale. They have massive economies of scale. So what should I do? I should make something that's something they're not willing to do. Yep. And so we make our process is one that the bigs aren't willing to do. And that means that the flavor is just better and it's chosen. Mm. See, I, I like that. I think people don't realize whatever industry it's like, you're not going to out sell United insurance and health insurance. You're not going to out like target target. Like you're not going to out Walmart, Walmart. So do the things that are going to make you unique and create your own niche group of, of whiskey drinkers to start. And then people are going to experience, Hey, this is the difference. So let's try it. That's why there are other other insurance agencies. That's why there's other places to go shop at. It's because people find elements that they love and they gravitate to them. And then when people do something well, then they'll pick it up. They're like, oh my gosh, this is something that I should have always had on my bar back to begin with. I know that's a really wide analogy, but economy as a scale is like the perfect way to talk about this. And I don't think it, it gets enough love to show how craft spirits really are. And you have to be set apart in those um, ways that you craft whiskey so that, that you're not just picking up MGP. They make great stuff. Yeah, they do. They make great product, but, but a lot of times the MGP that you're buying is massively priced higher, you know, and by merchant bottlers, um, than it needs to be right. Yep. And that, and, and what I like to say is, and what I've always said is from back when 2010, when I was first pouring this and people would tell me it doesn't taste like rye and I'm like, it's a hundred percent rye. Of course it does. Um, and, but what, as a rye person and a rye specialist, what I said is when the time comes that all over this country, 
people are making rye from grain to glass, you are going to find out that rye has just as much variety and excitement as does bourbon, as does single malt. That's but nobody knew it because 95% of what was out there was made in a handful of distilleries yep. under, you know, under multitude of, of imprints, but it was all the same juice just being blended and manipulated. So there's going to be a lot of commonalities to that. But when you start finding people who are buying local grain and fermenting and distilling it locally, what that is going to bring is the effect of terroir to that. So you're going to taste the minerality that's in, in a given place, or you're going to taste different, whether it be the kind of, um, you know, kind of that, those, those impacts from whether it be Oceanside, right? People doing it in places in California, it's like there's this salinity, you know, all of that is really exciting. And I think that's the kind of stuff, especially if you love whiskey, that's where you want to, you know, do you, does it really need to be the, the oldest version of, you know, something that's coming from Alberta or something that's coming from Indiana? You know, why not go a little more further afield and find something that is connected to its sense of place in a more interesting way? Mm. No, I think that's really interesting. And we've talked a little bit about that with like the American single malt movement, but I think it it, it does stand pat with rye whiskey, maybe even more so because it, it's further along in its journey here in the States is the, the regionality piece. You know, you have empire rye, you have Pennsylvania, Mahon- oh gosh, Scott said it. <laughs> Monongahela. Yep. That one. Um, and then you have, you know, Virginia and Maryland have a, a very rich history in, in rye whiskey production. And then you have Kentucky style and then you have Indiana style rye. And then you have malted rye, which has been made famous by old Potrero, right? Like, um, there, there's a, a lot of different regionality and that's just, that's East coast. But then, you know, I threw in a, a whole West coast, you know, thing there with, with what's old, old Potrero is doing. So I love the, the terroir and the regionality, um, because it, it's already, you know, those claims have already been staked almost in the, in the United States. Um, so speaking of that, just in general, like to, to drill down more, did Virginia have a lot more rich history than, than what we know of? Cause we hear about Maryland, we hear about Pennsylvania and some yeah, New York. That's, that's all like late. That's like late. Mm. You go back to, we're talking colonial times. So yeah. this is before the, you know, before and at the American revolution, when you're talking about Pennsylvania, rye And Maryland, rye, The only rye that anybody's ever got their hands on now is coming from around 1900. Right. Mm. You've got to go way back where Virginia was in rye. So let's talk about agriculture in Virginia. Yeah. Virginia was tobacco. Mm -hmm. And when you grow tobacco, tobacco strips the soil. And one of the pairing crops that pairs with tobacco to replenish the soil is rye. Mm. Now, when you're doing that, who, what's going on? Men are in the field because tobacco is extremely labor intensive. And so when you go and you have the rye that's harvested and then you go ahead and decide you're going to preserve some of that and make it into whiskey, who's doing that? It's the women. Mm -hmm. The women are doing the fermentation. Women do cider. Women do beer. Women do whiskey because there was not the role of men. Alembic steels had not come over. There was not distilling at scale. The, 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 Products that people talk about for the Maryland style rye or Pennsylvania style rye were almost a hundred years later when you had factories. Wow. So if you go to Mount Vernon sometime and you go check out their distillery, you will see their distillery and it's tiny. It's tiny. <laughs> it's got five little stills. It's in a place that's probably smaller than, uh, definitely smaller than most people's homes. That at its time when George Washington had it. So that was right, um, like, you know, right after the American Revolution, maybe 1780, 1790. George Washington's distillery was the largest distillery in the United States. <laughs> there were 13,000 distilleries in the colonies at that time. Wow. There were 3,500 distilleries in Virginia. Wow. Just for 
perspective, right now we only have 2,700 in the whole United States. <laughs> so that talks about what was whiskey. What was whiskey historically? Whiskey historically was tied to the land. It was mm. made by small producers and it was made by grains that were local, fermentation that was local, and all of that was done. They probably didn't even age it hardly at all, of course. Most of it was probably just, you know, drunk fast, sold fast, drunk fast. But that's really the roots of American whiskey. So you're talking about those other ryes. That The only reason people think about them is because there's still some that some people can get their hands on. Mm. And that's not really the true roots of what a mis- whiskey was in this country. I mean, most people were drinking rum at the for beginning, and then it took, you know, brandies and then whiskey to really come up. So I just like to say that, you know, what we were looking at was really what was Virginia agriculture? It was rye. How do we tie to that? And we try to make it local and we tried to go away from those highly automated processes and go to something that's tied to the skill of the distiller and has those textures and those flavors. And that was really important to us. And so that was, you know, where we leaned into that. Mm. Yeah. No, I see. I'm fascinated by this. I don't know about you, Scott, but like, I love history. I love like getting into the States that we don't really know about. Right. Oh, obviously Kentucky gets a lot of love because you know, that's where we're from, but you know, just hearing the stories of rye and, and going back to, you know, George Washington's day, like that's exciting because it, it shows that there's validity in what you all are doing and what you all are creating in Virginia. So I, I just, I think it's just really, really neat. Well, our, our governor likes to say that when bourbon was invented, Kentucky was Virginia. <laughs> smart, <laughs> smart person, <laughs> smart person. So as, as you all have, have kind of, you know, continued to, to go on and, and these stories are being told, you know, what's been the reception of, of your all's rye whiskey, you know, and now in almost 30 states uh, in the United States? You know, once people hear this story, I think they're really engaged by it, just like you are, because it's a new kind of story. I mean, most people like to talk about Pennsylvania and the Whiskey Rebellion, and people like to talk about Maryland rye and all that. But the part that came before, because so much of it was done on these small scales, it wasn't written down. These weren't companies with money to 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 save that. These were all small farmers, and most of them went out of business in a very rapid, um, you know, time frame. So, like from the time that George Washington was there, probably within the next forty or fifty years, most of those little distilleries that were farms went out of business. And the distilleries started to grow. And so you started to turn from what was an agrarian pursuit tied to preserving crops by farmers. It turned into these big businesses. Now women didn't do this anymore. Now it was man's work. And that's when history starts to write things down. And so that's why... Um, you know, nobody talks about it. There's a really interesting book. I believe it's by Sarah Meacham, if I remember it right, but it's called Every Home a Distillery. And she actually studied it. And she talked about, you know, how the alcohol business has kind of, it. it's written about men because everything was written about men. Um, even when women did it because women's names weren't considered important. And so those were, that's that's why those stories weren't told. Hmm. Because the women were too busy writing the books and writing the stories. <laughs> the women are and... too busy doing all the stuff that wasn't in the field. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they, yeah, just not just making the whiskey, but taking care of the family too. <laughs> yeah. Or running the taverns because yeah. in order to own a tavern, you had to have experience in having a tavern. And that was usually gotten by daughters of families who ran taverns. And so they'd get married and their husband's name would be the tavern keeper. But it wasn't because he knew how to run the tavern. It was because she knew how to run the tavern. <laughs> That's crazy. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, history is, is so, so crazy because we, we now have to go back and look at it with a fresh lens. And I think that's, it's amazing just to uncover the impact that women have had throughout centuries. Like we're talking a little bit uh, about, you know, history here, but you know, over the last 
300 years, women, their fingerprint is on every facet of everything that we, that's been done. And it, and it's just crazy to uncover that and, and hear those stories. Yeah. Whether you look at whether women and people of color, but all, all of them were in there. It's just when you start to really look for what's beneath the, um, you know, what's beneath what's on the surface. That's mm. when you really start learning things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, we could go a thousand different directions from here, but I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a simple way out. Um, so getting back to the whiskey, uh, yeah. in this, um, because you know, we, we haven't even talked about those yet, you know, so you, you have your base distal and you all have been going pretty strong now. Does experimentation ever, you know, cross your mind as someone who is an engineer, I'm sure process is at, at the key to who you are, like probably part of your individual like identity, like, do you all ever want to like tinker like with malted experimentation or uh, like extended age? Has, has that ever like crossed your all's mind and your all's, you know, just portfolio expansion? So we do a bottled and bond whiskey that we release, but it's very small. Um, it's a very small release. So we had um, the last of our 30 gallon barrels. So till 2016, I used to carry my barrels out to, a horse barn where I would age and I could carry four barrels in the back of a 93 Ford Ranger. <laughs> I couldn't get five in there because that Ranger didn't like to have five barrels, a little too much payload in there. Um, and we'd roll them down a ATV ramp, flip them end over end and put them in the, in the horse barn. And that was where we did a lot of aging. I could not do that with 53 gallon barrels. So I couldn't do extended aging because a 30 gallon barrel loses too much after four years, you're losing 30% of your whiskey. And so that's really doesn't make a lot of sense. So we have only just, you know, since 2016 started to put anything away in 53 gallon barrels. And we're going to start releasing some of some stuff that's maybe six years old for the bottled and bond release next year. Mm. Most of our roundstone that we do right now, what we do is a little different from what a lot of folks do. So a lot of folks blend to a standard to try to get a, um, you know, a certain kind of expression that is predictable. And what we do is a little different. We, we actually go through and we taste through each barrel and I'll take it like a dozen barrels at a time and I'll go through. And the first thing I want to do is see which ones taste perfect at cast proof. And so we go through and we just look for, and we're tasting for an experience. So for me, a cask proof whiskey, first of all, it's got to smell amazing. It's got to be like, you just got to like open, you know, pop up. Like when I pop open a drum where I've pumped the whiskey into it, I've just got to be like, yeah, <laughs> this is right. And, and then when you taste it, it's got to have, it's a got to, you've got to know it's a cask proof whiskey. So it has to have intensity to it. But the intensity should be simultaneous with the flavor. I don't want to sit there and burn and wait for a sense of what I'm tasting. I want to have that intensity and that flavor both come at me at the same time. The texture has to be really creamy and rich and kind of coat your tongue and give you the impression that it's less proof than it is, but still have sufficient intensity. The details of exactly what flavors I'm looking for, you know, sometimes it might have more cinnamon notes or more, you know, toasted. It might be a little different because every barrel has its own personality, but those are the kind of things I'm looking for in our cast proof. So every cast proof is going to have those kind of bits common, but it might have some different noses or you might have more citrus that shows up. All those things are cool with me. Then, then we'll taste the barrels that aren't quite right what we want at cast proof and we'll bring them to 92 and then we see which ones the flavor develops there so the 92 proof is for people who don't want a cast proof whiskey but they want a little bit more of that um that spice right so it's gonna have just a, it's gonna feel a little hotter it's gonna have some nice mint some nice spice on the finish the mid palate is gonna have some really gorgeous kind of citrus and plum notes and it's just going to be, you know, a really nice standing up to, you know, maybe like your Sazeracs or some of your more complicated cocktail kind of things. 
But then our, 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 our flagship and our first whiskey that we released is our 80 proof uh, roundstone. And that is just a front porch sipper. That's the one that we have. That's like my gateway for folks. I get so many people who come to me and say, I don't like rye. Oh, I don't like rye. It's too spicy. It's too, you know, it's too all of this. And I'm like, try this one. Because it's just the personality of the whiskeys that I'm selecting for this is just low key. It's chilling. It's got a lot of flavor to it, but it's it's not like a, a Kool Aid whiskey. It's got a lot of flavor because it is 100% rye, but it's balanced. It's fruity. It's got the spice, but it's just like a nice little kiss of spice on the finish, and it still works really well in like your classic Manhattan or old fashioned. So it's a really versatile, but a really great whiskey for people who come to me and say, "But I only drink bourbon." Mm. Yeah. And so, so they all have a different kind of experience that I'm tasting too. And that's really kind of how we describe it when we go through and taste them. Mm. Yeah. And you know, it's really interesting. I, I've drank through all three and I know Scott, prior to the podcast, you drank through all three. That, that 92 proof just kind of hits perfectly for me. Like it <laughs> that's just, my staff's favorite. <laughs> it's just, it, Jake, so my good. Tasting note, my tasting note on this was Jake's preferred. Jake's preferred. <laughs> uh, I, I knew it. I knew that you would like that one the most out of the three when I tasted these. It's it's just a balance of brightness with like some maple notes in it that is just it's easy to come back to. It's easy to drink, and it's just a it's a really viscous whiskey um, that doesn't have a lot of spice to it. It's got more sweetness to it. And it's just a smooth, like we were just talking to somebody they're like, don't use the word smooth. And I'm like, it is smooth. Like it, it's just, it just coats my palate super easily. Like I can, I can tell you what smooth means to me. It coats my palate yeah. and it's drinkable. And this is I a session that is whiskey those, for me. Those fats that we talk about yeah. from, you know, coming through that's texture and that's, that's weight on the tongue. And, 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 and that's really important for me. If it reads too hot, I don't really want it to be this expression. I want it to have a nice balance of spice and, and, um, and fruitiness. And I think this could I, fool I like, some people too, because it, it does have a little bit of bourbon characteristic. Mm. I like how you, uh, did the tasting in reverse order, because that's kind of how I did it as well. For some reason, I don't know why when I, when I tasted it on the first <laughs> So I had a lot more tasting on the, the cast proof, but it was very like bready and like cinnamon roll almost like the cinnamon note just, it just popped out of the glass. But, and then also it just has that lingering like citrus too, that pop mm -hmm. of citrus. So, um, yeah, I usually the, when I taste people, proof, usually yeah. when I taste people at them, like if I'm at a whiskey show, I'll taste people up the proof ladder, you know? Um, but when we're doing selections, we generally go the other way just because of, you know, it's it's a lot harder to find that perfect barrel that's perfect at cask. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. But they each give you something a little bit different. And mm -hmm. I think that's what's nice. Sometimes you, you can go up a flavor ladder or a proof ladder with whiskeys and they're like, oh, that's the same. Oh, that's the same. Like I can see, you know, the, it's just more intense notes. These are distinctly different from a, a proof perspective. And I can tell that water and, and the batching of these whiskeys have, have a thoughtful, thoughtful process to them, which is really uh, nice, especially when you can tell that there takes some serious um, like craftsmanship to, to creating uh, the end, the end product. It's a lot of fun because you know, you, what you're, what you're seeing here is, just what does the barrel really contribute, right? Because these are all the same mash bill. They're uh, they're almost they're they're all the same age for the most part. It's just what does the wood do, and that's really what we're kind of exploring through it. So, you know, I, I think Scott, you asked this question beforehand, so I'm not going to steal your thunder. So I'll let you ask the question about the the special release, um, Ragnarok. Oh yeah, so. <laughs> I guess in prepping for this podcast, you know, I, I, I remembered back to the, the unique bottling 
of the the rye whiskey that came out of nowhere. Um, the Ragnarok rye with it was it was your uh, collaboration with Guar. I was like, well, how does this little uh, distillery in Virginia come to make a whiskey with Guar and and a unique whiskey at that? It's, it'll always be my husband's absolute favorite press release to write was the one that he got to write with Gore because you can just go over the top. Gore is based in Richmond, Virginia. And um, one thing is that a lot of DC bartenders come out of or like were active in the punk movement. DC was kind of a center of punk and Gore came out of punk as well. And so there's like, Friends of Friends is kind of how it came to be. And so they came to us and um, they made a connection and wanted to know about doing a collaborative whiskey. And I thought it would be a fun way to use some kind of, you know, additional wood techniques that I had don't really use in my standard products. And so what we did was we took the, um, some of our it's a seven barrel, it, well, it's a seven barrel blend. Last year's Ragnarok rye was a seven barrel blend. Um, three barrels were um, just regular unfinished rye. And then I had four barrels and they had, we had um, added some additional staves of cherry and maple wood to those. And they brought those other flavor notes to it. And um and so that then then we just kind of I created a blend out of that, and that was what we did. Um, I made a few different blends. The band chose the one they liked the best, and then um, there was a collaborative work of of the label, and of course the bar tops are the heads of the band members, which mm-hmm. you know is uh, is something that fans of the band really enjoy. So it's, there's, there's a visual aspect to it. That's a lot of fun to work on with the band, but the, you know, the band was really um, interested in kind of, you know, they wanted something that they, I give them some choices and, and they choose the one they like the best. So we've, we've had, it was a lot of fun to work with them. And, you know, we're, we kind of try to do something a little different every year. So the first few years, the whiskey was kind of similar um, it was a similar blend. Um, so our new blend is um, is going to be similar. We're just going to add another element to mm. it. Um, and it's probably going to be like an eight, um, just like uh, it, we've got a different kind of barrel that we're going to bring in. And I really can't say too much at this point, but mm. it's going to have just another new flavor element to it. So it's going to be layered on top. And then it's going to have an, a new look and a new bar top as well. So if you are ever interested in a laugh, just because I just Googled Guar, first of all, it means, yeah. it, it means God, what an awful racket. If you didn't know that, uh, I didn't. Uh, and these, <laughs> their, their little uh, get-ups they wear on stage, hilarious. Like, yes, that is absolutely hysterical. Had no clue what Guar was until Scott made a deal about it before the podcast. If, and so now I had to if Google you it. Check, if you check out the, uh, uh, I think on Katakton, our YouTube, we actually have, they came the first year we did it and did some bottling. So they did it in <laughs> costume. So um, it was pretty funny. They oh, made a little video of their visit. So it's actually kind of hilarious. No, yes. that's it's definitely a unique collaboration. Let's just say that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's, yes. That's great. So everybody, it, everybody's googling Guar if they don't already know what Guar is. But, <laughs> yeah. Well, what's G-W-A-R. fun about it? We had a discussion and one, I, I think we had a conversation with a couple of journalists when we first released, and one of them really had kind of a good explanation that I think made a kind of sense to me in a way that maybe it didn't intuitively when we started, but. They said, you know, Guar was a band that kind of created itself. They call it artist collaborative. They made their costumes. They, you know, created their music. They kind of, it, like I said, kind of almost this punk, just I'm going to make a band and do it kind of thing. And the person who was writing about it said, you know, and that's kind of like Catoctin Creek in some ways that we just kind of went and decided we were going to do this and we just kind of, 
my husband and I got, you know, started it up, made a whiskey and kind of went our own way with it. So it's not like the standard template of how to run a craft distillery. We've never been the standard template. And um, whether it be that, you know, between us, I have the I'm the one who ran the stills and my husband ran the business, which was not at all the typical way to start. Or, you know, we're we're just going to do rye. We're not going to do bourbon. We're not going to do, the, you know, um, we're not going to have a rye, a, a single malt and a bourbon and then have a gin. You know, that's not our lineup. We just have rye. And, you know, maybe that's um, you know, maybe that was a crazy decision. Maybe it was a stupid decision, but it was kind of something we leaned into at the time. And we felt like it really gave us our own personality mm. like war, <laughs> <laughs> less blood, <laughs> less blood and less helmets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's, that's funny. But in life, you have to take these fun things as they come, right? Like you have to to enjoy. Did you ever really think, you know, back to when you were studying that you would eventually be a distiller? No. And, and you just kind of kept the, the greatest hits rolling, right? Yeah, I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> but then I found out that you have to sit too much and I don't like to sit. Scott, you sit a lot. You're a lawyer. I can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> And I love that unless you used, you're, unless you're a litigator and you're in the courtroom a lot, but uh, that's not me. So, oh gosh, I love that you use the the legal language to that. I attest to it. <laughs> I have to. If the shoe fits, right? But by, by law, I got to do it. <laughs> oh man, no, this is this has been great because first of all, I've just learned a ton about Virginia, and in that, I've learned how Catoctin is just setting their own path forward, and I think that's. That's what whiskey is about. Uh, I think a lot of people get caught up in the, in the hype of whiskey or getting aggravated that it's the same producer in a different bottle in a different bottle. Um, but it's so fun to sit down with a new, a, a new brand to us and have that conversation and, you know, experience the exciting things that are happening in a sister state, right? Like, um, and really, we could say it the parent state of of our of the great Commonwealth of Kentucky, uh, and so this has just been a very intriguing thing for us. And Becky, I just want to say I appreciate you know you spending some time with us tonight uh, because this has been a very interesting story and, and excited just to see what the future holds because the whiskey we have in front of us today is is unique and different and it, and it tells its own story. Thank you so much. You know, I'm just happy to tell our story to folks because I think that you know the more people get experimental with what's out there. You know, you can, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a passionate person about craft spirits. I'm, I advocate all the time for folks who make small, small stuff grain to glass, because I think that if you really want to taste the stuff, if you're a whiskey lover, there is more stuff being made in more unique ways right now across this whole country than there ever has been. And I think that I, I applaud you guys for going outside the, you know, the narrow realm of allocated bourbons to talk to people who are trying to shake things up. Mm. Yeah, we're, we're tired. We're tired of chasing whiskey. So we like to see what's <laughs> out there and, you know, really discover what's different. Yeah. Yeah, no. And, and this is different and, and it's exciting. And I think people need to, to understand 100 percent rye whiskey. And just rye whiskey in general, but but go go explore this. This is something that's unique. Um, they have some really cool releases, um, and and just the regular lineup is great. So go check them out over at CatoctinCreek.com, um, and you can check them out on their social medias. Just type in Catoctin Creek. There's probably not too many people with that name out there on social media sphere, <laughs> and and you'll find out all about them there. Becky, again, we truly appreciate you joining this episode of the Bourbon Lens and. And we'll just call it the Rye Lens for today. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, we we uh, wish you best of, of travels as, as you head out uh, tomorrow and, and continue to, you know, spread the good news and, and celebrate Women's History Month. Thank you so much, guys. It was a blast. We yeah, truly appreciate you. it. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Bourbon Lens. As always, you can find out more about Bourbon Lens at Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bourbon Lens. If you have any questions, drop us a line at info at bourbonlens.com. And last but not least, we have a growing Patreon community. 
we'd love to have you join there for awesome tastings as well as community. Uh, and you can do that at patreon.com backslash bourbonlands. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. Cheers.